Hello everyone, I'm, I'm Seifo Miradi, as the intro said. Um, I'm half Qatari, half Japanese. I'm a senior here at AAS, and the title of today's talk is The Napoleon Moment in Academics. So let's first address this elephant in the room. What is a Napoleon moment in academics, and why are you bringing Napoleon into another one of your talks, Seifu? Well, why Napoleon? A lot of people see Napoleon in different ways. A lot of Europeans see Napoleon as this great military genius, a tactician, went on this grand story and conquered most of Europe in the first French Empire. Russians might look at Napoleon as a villain, Hitler the prequel, or the Americans might look at Napoleon as creator of the modern US because he gave away this huge chunk of territory for pretty much free in the Louisiana Purchase. But the way I look at Napoleon, I see him as a torchbearer for social reform. Now, a lot of us seniors, we learned about Napoleon in 10th grade, social studies. And Napoleon pretty much changed the world with this with these set of reforms called the Napoleonic Code. And it's one of those few documents in the world that actually had a truly global outreach. In fact, a lot of governments today, some of the elements within them are from this Napoleonic Code. What I'm specifically a fan of, however, was Napoleon's education reform program in 1804. Now this was a very extensive <coughs> reform program, so I can't talk about it too much in depth, but here are some things he did. The one thing I like to highlight was that what Napoleon did was he moved control of the schools from church to uh, the government. Because before, of course, churches were pretty much dominant in schools. Teachers there were affiliated with the church. Uh, but so what Napoleon did was, you know, let's sponsor, let's let the government sponsor the teachers and let's create, uh, you know, a state-sponsored uh, school system. And of course today, that's the norm in society. And this was the first Napoleonic moment in academics in 1804. Napoleon saw a problem in the climate of the 1800s in regards to education, and he fixed that problem because of his political power, of course, emperor of the French. Now, Napoleon saw this, you know, crumb let's imagine there's a building, and this was what housed education. It was dilapidated, it was dysfunctional, it was crumbling. So he created a new building to house education for the next few centuries. Now, Napoleonic moments in academics happen every 200 years or so. That's a system I created, by the way. So this building that Napoleon built 200 years ago to house education is also now crumbling and being dysfunctional, and someone has to build a new house. There has to be a new Napoleonic moment in academics. So the question is, what is the problem that faces education today? There are so many problems that face education today. And I'm gonna focus on one specific problem. And that's the relationship between schools and universities and how that's drifting apart in the 21st century. Let me talk about both these institutions uh, independently first. Schools, they've changed massively since the first you know, inception of schools. Before, schools were only for the wealthy because education was very expensive. But you know, in the 1700s to 1800s, there was this move for uh, equality of opportunity for everyone to have the kind of right to have an education. It's one of the most inspiring stories where we came together and really uh, pushed for schools for everyone. Uh, so now schools play a very unique role in society. What schools do now is they prepare students for university. They uncover ambitions within people so that they could study in university. That's essentially what schools do. They represent what's available in university. Now let's look at universities. How have universities changed over the years? You think of universities in the 1600s, you know, glistening institutions such as Cambridge and Oxford, Sir Isaac Newton walking in the botanical gardens of Cambridge, wondering about the theories of physics. Now, of course, back in that time, universities originally, they were for the top, 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 top percentage of people within a country, the smartest, the brightest, the most cultivated, you know, the, the greatest of the generation. And of course, this was a very slim career choice to go to a university back then. It was only for the, you know, the brightest. 
Now, today, universities are completely the opposite. It's not for the top, 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 top percentage of people within a country, you know, the brightest, the greatest. It doesn't matter. Regardless of how bright you are, you still go to university. It's a necessity in uh, social mobility. After schools, you go to university. That's a given. Now, universities have been pushing very hard over the, uh, since, his, uh, since history began, of creating more diverse choices within university. I mean, us seniors, this year, we've actually had more choices available to us than in the history of education uh, in terms of the choices we have in universities. This is because of two reasons. One, there are more universities available. Universities are springing out of the ground as we speak. That creates more capacity, so more people can go to university. Second, more importantly, there are more courses being offered. And I don't mean courses like you know politics and philosophy, BA, right? I'm talking about diverse courses, such as uh, things you don't normally hear about, like geology, biotechnology, journalism too. Uh, you know, things that aren't really taught too much in schools. They are also being offered. Even marine biology is being offered uh, at, a, at a wide you know, level. I mean, Emperor Hirohito, he would be very proud of this moment where marine biology is taught in several schools. Now, one would assume, logically, that since universities are pushing for you know, this diversity in the options of, for courses, one would assume that everyone is making and taking use of these options. However, the, this, these are statistics that I got from UCAS, uh, which is the UK body for you know, universities. And this was the number of acceptances by subject group in 2011. And immediately it strikes you, because look at the huge inequality. On the, t on the, top, the top five have more than 50% of all applicants and the rest of the 10 subject groups or so are being you know, slowly un un underfunded, undermanned, as we to speak. At the top, you have, unsurprisingly, business and admin studies on the very top, I mean, by quite a lot. You have subjects allied to medicine, biological sciences, and social sciences. Those are among the top. And on the lowest on the spectrum, you have things like technologies. This includes Biotechnology. Biotechnology is a part of the technology subject group. That's, the front, that's a frontier science, as it were. You've got education, physical sciences, they're low. Mass comms and documentation, that's journalism, that's low as well. So there's a huge inequality here. Why aren't people making use of this diversity that's being offered in schools? And the answer is, very simply, there is an imbalance now between schools and universities. While universities have been diversifying the choices available for students, schools for the most part have remained the same in terms of the courses they offer. You think of the, you know, all the major diplomas used and the programs used in schools in the Western Hemisphere, as it were. What are the criteria for them? You've got, you throw in some English in there, some math, get a foreign language in there, some natural sciences such as bio or physics, and then get some history for culture and heritage, and boom, you've got your diploma, send it out, teach it to the kids. That's a very limited scope in terms of what's available in universities. And remember, what's the role of schools? You have to uncover ambitions within people. And far too often do I see students in the world, and you know, again, I'm not an adult or anything, but I see it myself, we have students, and from personal experience, even my sister, my younger sister, I mean, they don't know what they want to do in university for higher academics. They don't know what to do for their career. And this is a sign that schools are failing at uncovering ambitions. I'll give you a personal example. I want to study archaeology in the UK. Archaeology is my career path. And my passion for archaeology wasn't something that the school fed. It's something that I built on my own because schools don't offer anything related directly to archaeology. So I read on my own time books about archaeology, journals on archaeology, documentaries on archaeology. It was all done my, by my own time. The school wasn't a part of this uh, ambition that I had. It would be logical to assume, for example, say archaeology was introduced at AAS today as a course. It's probably not going to happen, but imagine if it was. It's logical to assume that more people would probably then be more interested in archaeology and some of them will eventually build a lifelong passion for it because they know, they'll understand what it's about and they'll realize they love it. So that's really the problem facing us today. And the question I get then is why is this 
really a big problem? Why, 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 is it on the, should, why should it be on the top of our agenda? And simply put, Earth, humanity, as we know, is facing a huge demographic crisis. In the next few decades, we'll hit 10 billion people. 10 billion people, that's the ceiling of humanity. That's the carrying capacity as we know it. And as we think of the word 10 billion, we think of can we feed 10 billion people? Do we have enough houses for living people's living spaces? We think of all these things, but what should also be considered is the fact that as we are pushing for equal opportunity for everyone across the globe for education, what's gonna happen then when we hit 10 billion people, more people are going to school and universities, what will happen then if we retain the same statistics that UCAS showed um, in 2011? Let me just quickly show this again. What would happen if, not the figures, but the percentages of the subject groups, what if this remained the same in 2050 when we had 10 billion people? First of all, what will happen is with the high tier kind of business and admin studies, for example, that's the highest, imagine when we have 10 billion people. How hard will it be, how competitive will it be to get into a university that offers business? I mean, us seniors, we love to whine about how hard it is to get into a good university when in a good course. But imagine our kids and grandchildren when there are more people going to school, so that means more people are applying to universities. It'll become insanely competitive. Not only that, as more people, if, if more people go to business than you know, any other subject, what will happen when everyone gets more and more business diplomas? Well, it's logical to assume there will be an inflation in the value of business diplomas, and you know, it'll be increasingly competitive. As a species, and I have a very pan-humanist view on this, I think we need to level this statistic out and prepare for when we get 10 billion people, because imagine if this was more even. Imagine if we took even 10% of the business and admin studies applicants and smudged them into technologies, one of the lowest uh, of the subject groups. That means there'll be more people doing biotechnology, some of the you know, frontier sciences and technologies. What about if more people did mass comms and documentation or physical sciences or agriculture? That means us as a species, we could go further and advance faster as, as a species. So, and you know, we're facing huge problems. And if, we, if everyone goes to, I mean, we shouldn't be putting all our chips into the top five of these subjects. We should be spreading it evenly. And the focal point of this is, of course, schools. So this is the problem that's facing us within the next few years. And, you know, this, and here comes the epic music, um, this is not something that can't be solved. You know, humanity always finds a way, and this is one of the great things about humanity. We always manage to have the right place, the right person at the right place, at the right time, with the right ideas to fix the big problems facing humanity. We've done it across centuries, and this case is no different. A Napoleon will arise and fix education within the next few decades. But the question is, who is that Napoleon? When will that Napoleon arise? Has this Napoleon just been born today? Or is this Napoleon already serving in a government? Or is this Napoleon sitting in this room at this very moment today? I'll leave the question to you. Thank you.